thanks for those fantastic presentations. Um, it's funny, Lisa, because actually I was going to ask you about that later. Maybe we can come back to that, that concept of your uh, previous work and how it made it possible to, uh, mm. to take part in this project. Mm -hmm. um, but I thought just to back up a little bit for those people who maybe um, aren't, aren't sure about how this project came together, we could, we could talk a little bit about that. Uh, you alluded to it, Elvira and, and Lisa as well. But um, so, so really it, it happened, well, a couple of years ago, we did a studio visit, Elvira and myself, and uh, you introduced me to your salt brine practice. I'd seen some of the work before, but you know, we talked about your work, and uh, and you did suggest this concept of a of a cafeteria. So I went away and and thought about that for a bit, and then um, and then I got an invitation from Lisa to wake Vicky, which was presented at the Tallest Poppy as a one night stand project. Um, thanks to Colin Zip, who I think is here <laughs> tonight. tonight. Um, and I wasn't able to attend, but um, you know, seeing the promotion for that project and I think seeing some of your other work just prior to that made me think, okay, let's do this studio visit. And, and you're really gracious in, in having this work set up in your studio. And, mm -hmm. and so then after that, it, it kind of uh, dawned on me, well, this just seems like a great fit to have these two artists work together. And I thought, how come this hasn't happened before? Although Brendan let it slip that, <laughs> that he also thought the same thing. He mentioned that to me today. So um, so then, you know, I, I suggested this possibility um, to Elvira and to yourself, and and that's kind of how it, it all came together. Basically, about a year ago is, is when that happened. Yeah. So um, I don't know if you uh, feel like you want to talk a little bit more about the process uh, than more closely leading up to this, maybe a little bit about the research that you did in preparation for this project, um, and, and, and why cafeteria? We could talk about a few different things. That's another question I have here is, is why, why Elvira maybe? Let's start with that. Why were you interested in exploring the campus cafeteria? Well. Cafeterias are interesting because they're informal. People make their own choices. There's very different behavior and mm. ritual-like or whatever ways of eating in a cafeteria. And so Lisa and I, when we started thinking about this as well, I mean, I knew that the leftovers would look very different. And that was mm. something I was kind of keen to explore because, again, you don't control Everybody hears me? Okay, good, thanks. Um, so I, th I knew that it would probably be quite interesting to see what would happen with those kind of leftovers. But also, we ended up um, deciding to visit the cafeteria, knowing <laughs> this would happen, and had a number of lunches, and were kind of taking notes, trying to be very discreet, and making, oh, look what they're doing over there, <laughs> and how this is all happening. And it was, it was really interesting, eh? you know? It was great, actually. Um, Having lunch in the cafeteria was lots of fun. Um, we definitely staked it out and were thinking about how we might want to w recreate things in the gallery setting, um, thinking about how people acted, uh, the look of the tables. Elvira was able to recreate the look of the specific cafeteria tables from Rideau Hall really nicely. Um, and sort of the amount of space that was left in, in the cafeteria. Uh, I know for myself, I took a lot of notes thinking about this sort of psych social psychological aspect of the cafeteria, uh, which as we can talk about maybe later, uh, didn't end up happening in the actual cafeteria happening um, because of the immense power of relational art. I, I totally underestimated the power of art to change people's behavior, so. Um, you did uh, both, I think, mention at some point just now and then earlier about uh, the concept of social psychology and this is, you know, fitting within to this idea of the relational aesthetic. And, and from my perspective, in terms of uh, programming Gallery 1 CO3, um, this has been a fantastic project because it has the capability to really cross disciplines of study here on campus. Of course, Gallery 1 CO3 being uh, University Gallery on a campus that doesn't have a fine arts program and I just could see all these linkages um, leading into this project with different areas uh, social psychology being one of them but uh, 
Yeah, that's, uh, I have to say, in terms of the visitors into the space, that that's been fantastic and really rewarding having having folks just come in from different classes. Um, I've kind of gone off on a tangent there, but I just wanted to mention that. Well, I, I think I, I ended up having quite a few conversations, especially with students, and but some of the uh, teachers and profs who were here. And there were some comments that were really quite, you know, st like one girl was just, just revolted at the amount of waste and why don't they eat up everything on their plates, you know? And um, uh, the, the idea of garbage or when you leave something over, I think in some ways it's a, a to me, it's a way of examining what we, what we leave behind and, and what the role is and how we, what our approach is to it. And um, there was a, just kind of interesting or co of the idea of it looking like an apocalypse. And in some ways, mm -hmm. that's another thing that I think of a lot. I think that idea that suddenly people leave and s something happens to what's left behind and, you've, and it almost becomes an archeological mm -hmm. site or a kitchen midden or something like that. Mm -hmm. So you, you kind of get something like that. So these conversations have been, and comments have been terrific. Yeah, the, the, you know, again, uh, I think you both referenced uh, the concept of time, right? And that's a really key element of this project, capturing this particular cultural moment, this moment in time. And um, But we could talk about um, your work, Elvira, maybe as archaeological evidence. We talked a little bit at one point about deep time, and then, um, but also something that uh, had been, that one of you had raised, um, this idea of... Um, maybe collapsing time, which I see, Lisa, in uh, looking at the collages, but I know you referenced that as well, Elvira. I don't know if that you want to talk a little bit more about uh, about this moment in time. Uh. Mm -hmm. I know in my practice, um, when I'm thinking about why I might make a painting versus having the photograph stand on their own, um, one thing that comes to mind for me is the fact that a painting can collapse time in um, a way that a photograph might not. So um, that's a strategy that I've definitely used in uh, the collages and the paintings to talk about multiple things that happened over uh, the period of time, but being able to see it in one succinct image. Yeah. And I, I think that just, I've worked so long with the time lapse idea and trying to create videos and just have an idea of that uh, changing in time. And as I said, with the, the time lapse videos, uh, just the, the single bowls, they were very meditative and that's an interesting thing. Mm -hmm. Kind of looking at times, looks like it's going very slowly, but it really has speeded up mm -hmm. and you get the whole idea of, you know, the the wet pennies to the dry ones in maybe 20 minutes or less, and it's kind of interesting that way. When you use the term med meditative, um, it also made me think that it was it's very quiet in that space, which is interesting. Mm -hmm. um, after having seen the video that you'd produced with sound, um, so it's a bit bit haunting in a way. It's this is the, you know what's what really what is left behind, and it, it's a bit it's a bit haunting. Yeah. The other thing I, I wanted to mention with regard to time too, it was interesting as you were talking about these different projects and how um, the projects that you'd shown reflected a particular moment. That whether it was the tea party or you talked about the, you had carefully chosen the, you know, the ceramics, the pottery, and um, and it was about the wine glasses. And um, this project you mentioned shows the uh, the marketing and the, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of the product that is left behind, and that also is seems to be evidence of a yeah, specific. It's a little, it's a little edgier and it's a little more contemporary and it's definitely out of my control. And that was something that is kind of, uh, you know, I, I think I, I do fight with that, that idea of controlling and not controlling in this mm -hmm. work. And this really went way into the area of not controlling. And it, it proved to me very interesting in some ways, you know, the newest baby is the one you love the most, you know, but mm -hmm. <laughs> that's the way I'm feeling about this in many ways, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's actually interesting hearing you talk about that idea of control. And um, it's something that I know I have a really hard time with, the letting go of control in the artwork. And um, as I alluded to in the previous comment with going to the cafeteria and trying to figure out basically what I was going to do after the event happened, um, the fact that the event went so differently than I expected really did blow away all that sense of control and, and planning. 
um, but it made me have to go back to the original intention, which was to respond directly. So really, it was best that it happened in the way that it did, yeah. but um, not overly reassuring in the moment. Yeah, I would say a nervousness ensued. <laughs> right. So, so how did it go differently? Can you talk a little bit about that, about how it, how it came together a little bit? It, didn't come together exactly as you expected. And, and what were the surprises, I well, suppose? When you go to the cafeteria itself, you see a lot of people either sitting by themselves alone, a lot of use of the, uh, you know, the iPhones and various handheld mm -hmm. devices. Uh, a lot of people have are working there with their computers set up or even books, you know, and fully expected that it might be used in that fashion. And we didn't expect as many people to sign up, so it was more crowded. So mm -hmm. it was really table folds rather than little bits. So uh, it, we thought there might be more uh, loneliness, and it turned out people were just sat down and talked to each other and were coming for a meal. You know, it was great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the the most ideal <laughs> university cafeteria that you could possibly <laughs> imagine. Um, <laughs> you know, people actually came in and sat down with the table full of people instead of sitting at the table that was empty. Uh, and when they sat down, they introduced themselves and uh, people actually had conversations. And um, the university population is so wonderfully diverse here. And each table was a complete reflection of that diversity. So um, yeah, I felt like it was this utopic U of W moment. Um, <laughs> A poster moment, on yeah. it, honestly. <laughs> it was like, wow, look at this, hey? Yeah. And there were uh, staff there as well. The uh, president of the university was there, and I think she was enjoying herself. It was kind of an interesting thing to see. Uh, Serena, whose class this sort of is, <laughs> yeah. we've hijacked it. But uh, <laughs> Serena was there as well, and it was really wonderful to have staff and students and meeting <laughs> new people, too, that you didn't mm -hmm. know before. Yeah. Um, so, you talked about this a little bit, you know, at the end of your presentation, Lisa, with uh, Wake Vicky, maybe as sort of, a, in a way, really, in retrospect, great preparation for this project. Is there anything more you'd like to add about that in terms of um, the process here? Because you were really under um, a lot of constraints to produce work really quickly, and it's been pretty intensive, so I'm not sure if there's something else you might want to add about that. Well, I think that um, in the in the very beginning, it was maybe obviously the most stressful, the idea of having um, blank walls that needed to be filled, or at least I needed to make some sort of visual impact. Um, I think that the, in retrospect, the most difficult thing about it is that I've been trying to create work and put it into the gallery um, without doing a lot of reflecting on the work itself. And um, my, my process is normally quite a lot slower than that, um, a, a lot more self-critical. And in some senses, it's been very freeing. I haven't had the time to doubt myself. You have to make decisions and enact them. Um, and now, when the exhibition closes, I'll have some time to reflect and make decisions and try to bring something together uh, that responds to the images and the happening in a way that I think is appropriate. And I guess the further away we get from the event, we also have this element of memory that comes into play. So it starts to be about how I remember the event and then how that interpretation is put onto the photographs from the event. And um, it'll be interesting to see how it rolls out from here. Yeah. You know, and um, yes, there'll be a lot of time for, for further editing, but it's been really fascinating for me and I think for the folks coming into the space to see though really even though responding quickly the editing process as it's taken place throughout the course of the four weeks mm -hmm. and also to Elvira to watch you in terms of how you edited because there was some editing that you have done as well mm -hmm. and uh, so that's been really quite rewarding for me and I think for the gallery attendants who work in the space and are there regularly and for folks who certainly we did have quite a number of repeat visitors uh, people were very curious I don't know if there's anybody there's uh, well 
students who participated, maybe in Serena's class, uh, in the happening that are here, but uh, we definitely saw repeat visitors who participated wondering how, how things are progressing and trying to find their image and, and mm. see is it going to, uh, how are they going to be represented, and uh, it's been fascinating. Well, there were um, a couple of people that were, a couple of students who were a part of the happening who came earlier to the reception, and um, the one student was um, just so proud because he had become the star of this one piece and um, I was happy that he felt excited about it. You never know how people are going to actually react once they see their images and one thing that um, I'm trying to give myself permission to do is to react honestly to the images and to not worry about trying to be um, particularly flattering in uh, the way that things are rendered because I want to have this idea of um, the messy parts of life and eating is truly a messy part of life. Um, but everyone so far has seemed pretty delighted, so it's a nice thing. We'll yeah. see. Eh? We'll, see <laughs> if, we'll see about that. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there anything that you'd like to say before I open it up for a question and answer? Because I know we're, we're going a little bit beyond the time that we'd said, but I think yeah. I'm fine. It's just, it's been fun. Good. Yeah, it's been, I've really enjoyed working with you both and I'm looking forward to this next year and the process ahead. Um, one thing I wanted to say um, that I mentioned at the reception is um, I want to thank uh, in particular Diversity Foods and all of the participants um, because certainly this project has been a risk for uh, Elvira and Lisa for Gallery 1 CO3, you could say, um, and certainly also for, for diversity and uh, who provided the food, of course, that was, uh, that was eaten and is left behind, um, and of course for the participants as well. So I wanted to mention that again. Um, and, and, and our great tech staff, I don't know that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely, yes. So there's a lot of um, behind the scenes work and uh, Michael Zayat, who's here today, uh, was just incredible and uh, Bill Eakin as well as documented uh, the project um, Brendan and Ian Lark who've done graphic design on the project Glenn Johnson's the uh, gallery's preparator um, the gallery attendants I want to thank them as well uh, the gallery actually has a an art education program for kids in in school so school and youth groups are invited to come to the space and in and um, have a tour of the exhibition, engage in some, some discussion around it, and respond to it. So we're uh, looking forward to having some school groups coming through in April. Um, but you know, I think I'm going to just uh, now hand it over to the audience and see if folks have any uh, questions, comments, and yeah. Well, I, I do like the idea of kind of bringing yourself to a cliff and seeing what, you know what happens if you jump off you know and uh, no but just that idea that that if you allow a chance to play its role and and allow like salt brine to, it's it's almost alive when it in certain settings it feels like it has a life of its own and, and I know that you know in in life we do try to control a lot but there's so much it's beyond we all know that beyond our control that's what it's it is to be a human there are so many things that happen to us there's so many things that occur and to to kind of work with it and I find that really interesting and of course uh, you know salt for me has really uh, proved to to do that and it's uh, you know it's usually by now I understand most of the things it does but there's always things that are surprised in every piece I've worked on there's surprises and unpredictability and um, yeah it's been it's been really interesting and and you know all along I've been inter tr interested in the work of the data uh, artists and the surrealists so right right from the get-go that's sort of been a big influence in my life so thanks for relating that mm -hmm. I guess for me, using um, time lapse, as I mentioned before, it really does take um, that control away, and it allows me to be more in the moment. Um, personally, I have a hard time taking photographs uh, in my life at all. I don't like being behind the camera and witnessing what's happening. I want to be kind of... <laughs> It's funny because I don't actually really want to be in the middle of it. I'm a bit more of an introvert than that, but um, 
being behind the camera, I, I don't like invading people's space when I'm behind the camera, but if I set the camera up to invade people's space and they agree to do it, then I don't have to think about it anymore. And um, I'm just left with all of this information. And I feel like if I was trying to capture particular kinds of moments, I would actually miss the things that the camera does capture. Um, in the random nature of it, you really are seeing these amazing uh, little moments where people forget what they're doing for a second and they just let themselves be really momentarily. And, and those are the moments that interest me the, the very most. The tricks of the trade? <laughs> <laughs> the tricks of well, I'm not asking the uh, method. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm working with objects right now um, in my studio. And to a certain extent, I can work with them. But salt, um, what I have discovered is that um, it depends, uh, the salt, the type of crystals it forms and how it works depends a lot on the, the humidity, uh, the, maybe the barometric pressure. I've done a lot of tests where I tried slides, glass slides, and if I did them all on the same day, this, the type of crystals were the same. If I'd wait a day or two, the same glass slide would be a little bit bigger or smaller. The, the formation with the same brine would turn out very differently. And I've noticed, I mean, uh, I've recently gotten almost like big crystal that look like popcorn. It, it shocks me that you can get those huge, huge crystals, you know? What I've noticed downstairs is that some uh, up on the screen right there, yeah. for a second they're like very different crystal forms. Uh, yeah. Some are like glassed over. Yeah, ice, like, yeah, like, like little coral, sheets or, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, popcorn, as you say. So I was wondering if you were able to predict based on what the uh, uh, what's underneath what's it. What's underneath it or the, the not not so much you know that those are the things I've I know that books often create <laughs> that you can get that kind of papery almost like they get wings that come out but other things I don't know what will produce that kind of a wing like kind of it thing so yeah it's it's sort of uh, and you know if there's a different climate the f I started doing this when I lived in Pittsburgh for uh, uh, almost five years and um, it was much more humid and the same piece that I did one there and I tried something very similar here, it would take almost two months to crystallize. Here it's two weeks because of the dry temperature, you know? And the humidity sets it off again. So that's another interesting part about it. Yeah. The time of year must here. Right? Yeah, must a little bit, but you know, we have quite a relatively dry climate, so it's very interesting that way. Mm -hmm. Twelve hundred photographs, mm -hmm. and then Elvira's main camera over the whole space was taking photos slightly less quickly than uh, the photos at the table. Yes. So there would have been just under a thousand, I'm sure. Wasn't that? Weren't we? No, we were getting more from the. Because well, it was that was going on through the crystal. I think in the three thousand range from that camera. Yeah. Whoa. Uh, really? Yes. From the one that's in the gallery now. Yeah. Certain. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was a, about 3,000 images, I would say. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, collated. Mm -hmm. So. <laughs> I'm looking forward to uh, seeing seeing that footage. Yeah, and, um, and we also have a, I don't know if we mentioned that, there's a camera over one of the tables, and mm -hmm. that uh, has been going for four weeks pretty well, and it's ca tracking the uh, crystallization. So we have to see how that actually turned out as well. Yeah, exactly. That's what I'm yes. really curious yep. about too. I'm planning to create a painting installation. I don't know much more other than that at this point, but um, I do feel like uh, by having to produce so much so quickly, uh, it's really generated a lot of ideas and I'll be kind of taking the next little while to um, see where some of those ideas take me and then be able to settle on the direction that, that I want to go. But mm -hmm. I'm envisioning um, an installation of paintings. How about you? Well, um, I'm thinking of, of I have in the past uh, saved some items that 
actually were on the tables and I would like to kind of uh, take them away as, as if they're artifacts. I'm not sure exactly what I'd, uh, I'll find interesting and maybe some of the, it'll almost be a kind of a theme there or it could be random pieces. The other thing is the, the video may end up being something brilliant and, and we, <laughs> we hope <laughs> the time lapse over the table, it could be very interesting. And uh, also the table tops themselves can often turn out to be very interesting and could could produce something that would be worth seeing. And as well, I'm taking photographs. So uh, among all that, something I hope we'll, we can work it all out that can work together <laughs> in the space. Yeah.